Okay, we're recording. Um, today we have with us Jennifer McCauley, Youth Services Coordinator at the McPherson Public Library. And she's gonna be talking to us about youth services. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Jennifer, and I'll try to uh, monitor the chat for you. Okay, perfect, thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right, um, like you said, uh, Jennifer McCauley. I'm currently at the McPherson Public Library. I've been here just for about a year and a half. Um, before that, um, I'll try to make sure all of my stuff is going. I always have problems with my presentation. Okay, so this is me. And pardon my silly photo, but I pretty much always have a silly photo. There are very few serious photos of me out there in the universe, um, to be honest. But this is exactly the type of photo that I would normally use if I was doing a similar thing or marketing something to teens that would include a photo. I honestly wouldn't include a serious photo of myself. I feel like it doesn't necessarily appeal to teens. And I really want to make sure that they have something they can relate to, if that makes sense. <laughs> um, and so right now I'm here, and before this, I was the young adult marketing librarian in Great Bend for many years, and the collection development consultant for the Potawatomi Wabunsee Regional Library for a couple years before that. So I've kind of done the whole spectrum of youth services, uh, which is kind of nice. Um, today, I'm going to keep it brief and somewhat general. Um, I want to try to keep any suggestions that I offer you very easy to implement because I know a lot of you, I'm told, are from smaller libraries and you might be soloing all, any of your youth services that you provide. So I want to make sure that it's something that's actually useful for you. And feel free to um, stop and ask questions if you want to unmute and ask a question or if you want to type it in the chat box and Mike will interrupt me. I'm okay. I'm I'm pretty casual when I present, so I do not mind interruptions at all. Um, working with kids and teens, I'm quite used to being interrupted when I talk, so. And I'll try to stop at certain points as well for any kind of questions. Um, first up, I want to kind of go briefly over collection development. I know you have a different session, I believe, on collection development specifically. So, but I want to touch a little bit on some of the differences you're going to see when you're doing collection development for your children and your teens, because it is a little bit different than your overall general collection development practices. One of the main things that really hits is the changing in your trends. You'll notice this particularly with your teen collection, that your trends and what's popular will shift very rapidly. What was popular last year in my library is not popular right now in my library. Um, I do notice that a lot of our, your trends in your community are going to mirror what's popular in your movies and television shows. So, Ask them what they like to watch, and that can help you focus what genres you need to really be buying for your collections. And this works for your older kids as well. Um, several years ago, supernatural and paranormal fiction was huge when the Twilight movies were coming out and Vampire Diaries was just coming out on TV, and so they were flying off the shelves. In the past couple of years, it's picked up with post-apocalyptic and dystopian fiction with the Hunger Games and Divergent and Maze Runner all being made into movies. So that's really hit a climb. Currently, I'm noticing particularly here and some other libraries that I've talked to that science fiction is really starting to rise a bit with, with our teens. Um, some of the newer science fiction books like um, Illuminae is probably one of the biggest one that's out right now. It's by Amy Kaufman and Jay Kristoff. Um, it's a beautiful book. It's just a collection of different like files. And so it's something that's accessible because it's a very huge book. So large page count, but it's one of the quickest reads they can have. So it reaches a lot of those kids that when they were younger, because this is one for older teens, but when they were younger, they liked Diary of a Wimpy Kid because it has all those extra illustrations. And this is sort of that same style, but in science fiction and for your older ones. And it is hands down one of the best audiobooks that I have heard in recent years for teens. It's fabulous. And it's a book I can't keep on my shelves at all. So I'm noticing with that, science fiction is definitely 
um, making a climb. I'm noticing a little bit in the fantasy realm as well with fairy tale retellings. A lot of those are being published now, and so it's starting to pick up speed. We saw it. We saw it about 10 years ago in young adult fiction, and it's starting to really climb again, even with our, our children's fiction. Another thing I want to point out with your children and teens is weeding. Um, I hope all of you love to weed. <laughs> I know it's some people's not, it's your, not your favorite thing. Uh, you're going to need to learn to love it when you're doing your children and your teen collections, because when you notice all those trends shifting so rapidly, it means you need to get them out of your collection. You need to free up that shelf space for some of your new stuff. And I know that can be very hard, um, particularly in your teen area. Many of you, I imagine, probably don't have a great deal of space for your teen collections. Um, so you have to be a little heavy handed when you get rid of books, which for some of us can break our hearts. Jennifer, we did have a question. Um, yeah. I just noticed, I'm sorry. Who is the author of that sci-fi book that you just mentioned? Amy Kaufman and Jay Kristoff. Thank you. So it's the two author team, um, but it's beautiful. The book itself, I wish I had my copy. It was here on my desk, but I had a teen in here on Monday and I was book talking it and they, they took it. So a uh, teen has absconded with the copy that I had, but I'm all for that. I'd already listened to it. I was just going through and looking at the visual aspect of the book equally just as awesome. So awesome. I can't stress it enough. Awesome. <laughs> um, so anyway, um, with your teen collections, and I know you guys have a chat feature. Does it allow them to like raise their hands or comment? How many of you have teen collections like separate in your libraries? Do you all have that? Does anybody not? You all should be able to, to raise your hands. Um, yeah, it's in the participants window at the bottom. Raise hand if you want to, to do that. Okay, there I see. You seeing them now? Yeah. All right. All right. So some. And then while we're waiting for folks to raise their hands, um, there is another question in the chat room. <laughs> How would you suggest posing the issue of frequent weeding in juvenile and young adult fiction to one's board who are reluctant to let go of items that haven't been in the collection very long? Okay. Um, how I usually do it is, and a lot of times with mine, my board really supports it. I, I came here and I had a somewhat unhealthy collection of very old stuff. Um, with some of your, if it's particularly new, I would definitely give it a chance if you think it's something of quality. By all means, book talk it, put it on a display, try to get into their hands. If they genuinely don't want to read it, then you always have to kind of sell it to your board as, uh, this is prime real estate. You have this much space that fits approximately this many books. You can either put books out there that the kids are going to check out. It kind of is, um, um, do they want to see the circ stats? You know, and so you want to be able to have those circulation numbers rise, and you can't do that if you, I guess, <laughs> one of your parallels is there's a reason we call it weeding. If any of you like to garden, how do you make your garden grow? You have to get the weeds out. You have to grow, you have to pull out what's stunting your healthy, vibrant part of your collection. And so I know that's sometimes a very hard sell to certain boards, but I think if you're doing it properly, once those circulation numbers start to rise, they're going to fully support your efforts. And um, I will say, usually I use, um, are, are you guys, I, oh, this is another opportunity to raise hands. Are you familiar with the crew method of weeding? Not too many. Uh, the crew method is done from a library outside of out of Texas, and um, it's kind of a really good way to. Um, I'm trying to think of the best way to phrase this. <laughs> they have the different categories for your entire collection for how long you should wait to have it in your collection based on circulation, based on how long it's been since um, the copyright date. And it's kind of a good one-stop shop if you're new to weeding and how long you should wait before you withdraw it. And if you have parameters set up and you can kind of tell your board why you're doing it, I would, I would recommend looking up, and it's just crew method, 
um, it's a great manual. I keep a copy printed off in a binder and that's what we reference all the time. So whenever I'm pulling my weeding reports, I can easily sort it by those standards. Um, and it's got a very easy breakdown with, um, with I'm trying to think of the, the right word to phrase, um, based on your Dewey Decimal numbers. So each of them you weed based on different parameters because your history books might not become as outdated as quickly as your medical books. And this applies in your adult collection as well as your kid and your teen collections. So you've got a good crossover amount there. That helps. And her follow-up here is, um, I'm concerned that they will then say if the book is only going to be popular for a few years, we shouldn't bother buying it in the first place. I see it from the viewpoint that if we don't have what the kids want to read, they'll go to the other libraries that do, and then we lose those kids, either temporarily or long-term. Yeah. I so. have to say, it's one of the hard things for a lot of adults to wrap their brains around that teens today don't want to read what teens five years ago were reading, um, and kids are the same way. Um, whereas adults sometimes that those very popular authors like James Patterson and Janet Ivanovich, they really stand the test of time. And it's really not the same when we're working with our youth. And um, sometimes when I'm having to deal with people who don't quite understand that, I can pull out some facts about brain development with our kids and how important it is that literacy is more important sometimes than that bottom line of our budget. And if we're not helping build their literacy skills by giving them books that they want to read and that they can read, we're actually doing more of a disservice than anything. And that is our primary goal. And if your library has a mission statement, and I really hope all of you do, as long as what you're doing goes back to that mission statement, I think you'll have maybe more support than you might think. I hope. <laughs> I hope that answers it. Um, for any of you who don't already have your teen collections, even if they're not separate, and I do recommend if you can getting even just a single set of shelves designated for your teen collections. I think for any of you who don't already have them, you've got more multi-age popularity within your teen collection than you might think because you've got a lot of adult readers who love teen books. Um, that is a huge, huge amount of readership. Sometimes they will be embarrassed and they will apologize to you because they want to read out of your teen collection. And you just tell them, that's okay. Read whatever you want to read. So, uh, Jerry wants to know if you have a copy of those facts from a couple of minutes ago, because um, I'm a little slow at getting these out. Um, from the, which ones? Jerry, do you want to, uh, I'm <laughs> trying to read and uh, method, let's see. I think she's referencing literacy and like brains and teens. Okay. Yes. Um, I will make sure to post some links to that on, on the Moodle for you guys. Um, I think I've got some in some nice infographics too that make them really nicely easy to print off and share with people. Um, I, I feel like some of those are always good statistics to have in your back pocket. So anytime you're, you're stuck with somebody, um, it's a good kind of elevator speech to pull out to support youth services in general. So, but I will make sure to I will make sure to add that to the Moodle class. Okay. Okay. Um, and then Dan, uh, Dan, I'm sorry, Dion Burns uh, says, "I told my board that the teen books are like buying teen clothes or shoes. They've outgrown them faster than uh, adults do and need updated more often." So that's that is actually the perfect response. I like that. <laughs> I'll have to remember that. It really is. Yeah, <laughs> I, I remember when I was a teen and how quickly I outgrew shoes. So you, know, <laughs> you really gotta you gotta change it fast. <laughs> Stunt their growth. That's what happens. <laughs> Exactly. All right. Um, yeah. I'll move on to the next. There we go. If I can go the right way. All right. Um, a couple of things I want to highlight not to neglect with your purchases. And the first one is graphic novels. Graphic novels can sometimes get a bit of a bum rap, um, but I want to point out they are actually a truly valid literary art form. Um, can I get you guys to raise your hands? How many of you have like a separate graphic novel section in your library? 
fingers crossed. Okay, so. Samantha posted in uh, the chat that she has a shelf. Perfect, yes, I like that. I think anytime you can highlight that, you have a really good, um, a good excuse to really highlight a collection that's very popular. Um, even if you can't separate it, it's understandable, but I do wanna urge any of you to consider if you don't already having graphic novel labels on the spines of your graphic novels to make it easy for them to find when they're shelf browsing. We've always had one here in our teen collection, but this is our children's collection, which we just started like two months ago. Is that showing up the picture on the screen? This is my graphic novel section in my library. This is what I see every day after school. I see a kid lying down on the floor. I see another one usually sitting on this kickstand and I see them at the end of the aisle. And that's pretty much where they live as soon as school gets out. It didn't take them long to find that section and it is, by far one of our most popular. And it's honestly just a great sight to see. <laughs> um, I wanna point out with, with graphic novels, cause this is something you always have to tell your parents cause sometimes you'll have parents come in and it's the only thing my kid wants to read. How do I get them to read real books? I always point out, this is a gateway book for reluctant readers. Visual learners, can build logical deductions from context clues that they see in those illustrations. And interpreting an image is just as educational as reading text. So for literacy purposes, they actually do more than a lot of people give them credit for. So please do not uh, discount graphic novels. A site I want to share with you, if I can, oops, hold on, if I can, get it to open up the switch a little bit is the site um, it's called no flying no um, this is presented by librarians from across the country and they all contribute it's a great way to get just general content information um, and age breakdowns are up here so if I'm looking for you know new ideas for what to buy for my kids collection, it's gonna kind of give me little tiny synopsis of them. Like this one, I, I just, I love the title and the artwork on this. It's would be such an easy sell. Hippopotamister, he's very fancy with his hat. This is something that's an easy sell for, for any of my kids here. And it's gonna kind of tell me what it's about um, and just a general review of it. And sort of, a, it's, sometimes it'll give you like little grade levels so very, very helpful. Um, so I do recommend it. Again, noflyingnotypes.com. And these, these links should all be up on the Moodle site already. So if you don't have time to write it down, they will all be on there for you. Okay. Um, keep changing hats. Hold on, pardon me. <laughs> All right, um, the, the other thing on here that I wanna highlight are high-low books. Um, this stands for high interest, low reading level. These are specifically designed to help your struggling or reluctant readers in your library. They strengthen comprehension skills. They build their confidence. Um, a lot of our kids who struggle to read will simply stop because they feel a little despondent at a certain point because they can't read as well as their friends do. And this is kind of a good gateway book to just, they're thin, they're very, very thin. They have larger font, they have lots of dialogue, they're very short sentences, simple, simple vocabulary. They're typically realistic drama, which for a lot of our reluctant readers appeals to them a little bit more. They have easy, easy storylines and as the best part of it is they don't have as many characters. I think we neglect sometimes when we're reading other fiction how many characters there are in a story. And for certain kids, that is a lot of people to keep track of and figure out who was this, why are they important? So this kind of helps that. And it's good because we don't lose that readership if we can find them something that actually 
appeals to them. And on that, there's School Library Journal does a really good roundup of different options. Um, and so occasionally I like to come on here and see if they've presented more high-low books. Um, one of them I want to point out, the company Orca Books is right here. And they're one of our predominant publishers of high-low books. So if you're ever just needing some for your collection, I suggest just looking for some, I, usually Orca soundings is what they're called. And that is a good starting point. Do you guys have any questions on any of that? Okay. Sorry, occasionally my taskbar disappears and I can't actually move my presentation. <laughs> Hold on. Okay, there we go. Yikes. All right. Technology is so fun. All right. Um, next up, because a lot of you have limited space, I imagine, and also probably limited budgets, particularly for your youth collections, I want to give you some suggestions on how to be the most selective you can. So it'll give you a little bit of focus when it comes time to ordering it. So you're not just haphazardly ordering whatever is the first thing you find. And hopefully with any luck might also be a time saver for you. And the first step of those, and I'm going to switch back over because I'll share some more resources, are your award winners. And one of your big ones here is American Library Association. They have their very, very comprehensive list of book, print, and media awards. And this one, this list is for all ages and it's very extensive. So basically just go to ALA and look for their book award list and it's gonna give you every national award um, you could possibly ever want to have. And it's also good just for general collection development because it is for all ages. Another one that's specifically for youth services is for the American, the Association of Library Services to Children has their own list of book and media awards. And these are also national level awards. Let me see if I can get my computer to scroll. There it is. And so it's just got a huge list of different awards. So you click on these links and it'll take you to those recent award winners. This does not include any local or state level awards. So for things like the William Allen White Awards, which I hope all of you are familiar with, they are not included on this list, but I do highly, highly recommend that you have those in your collection because those are very, very popular with kids in all communities because your schools are using them and often they can't it's good if you can also have a collection because they might have them there, but it's good for the kids to have multiple places to be able to find those books because they will be very popular around um, nomination time. Those lists go out to libraries months in advance before they are made public. So it gives you a chance to purchase them before everybody knows what's going to be on that list. And depending on budget wise, these are also things that for me anyway, I get duplicate titles of these because my schools use them for a lot of their book competitions. For their battle of the books tournaments, they usually focus on the William Allen White nominations. So I always try to make sure I have extra copies so we have plenty. And honestly, they circulate so much that usually I keep the extra copy for maybe a year, maybe two. And by then they're usually so worn out they have to go anyway. So but it's kind of a, a shameless plug. I'm on the William Allen White Committee, so we do a we try to do a very good job of getting good titles that you'd want in your collection anyway. So, all right, next up because we've done children's book awards are your teen book awards, and for there I always like to go to the Young Adult Library Services Association or YALSA, and both of these are also part of the American Library Association, and they're also really good just groups to belong to, and I'll kind of go a little bit over that later. This list is book awards, um, so things like the Odyssey Award or the Prince Award. Um, I hope most of you are familiar with the Prince Award. It's probably one of the biggest in young adult literature, and it was actually named after Michael Prince, who was a big Topeka librarian, so it's kind of nice that it has Kansas roots in it. 
So this is good. It also has really amazing book lists. So if you're struggling to figure out what to buy for your teens, this is one of the best places you can start. Um, here they've got their best of the best list, which they have a selection committee of librarians in the country who focus on this. They also, in their general group here, there's one called the Teens Top 10. And I always like to highlight this a little bit because this one's a little different than a lot of the other lists on here because this is a list that is nominated and voted on by teens. Only teens can select these books and only teens can choose which ones are on the top 10. So these ones are actually vetted by the kids who should be reading these titles. So it kind of gives it a little more credibility. And they also have a teen book finder app sponsored by Dollar General. So for all of your tech savvy teens, this is something they can put on their smartphone and get a suggestion. So it's kind of nice. Um, other things for a collection, um, any best book lists, um, Kirkus always does their roundup at the end of every year. So right now they've got their best books of 2016. These are all of the ones that would have been starred in all of their copies throughout the year. So even if you're just focusing on looking at starred reviews and buying those titles for your library in either Kirkus or School Library Journal or Hornbook, those are some good options and could focus you a little bit more. Um, let's see, another part, I don't wanna switch back to that slide, but that top banner part keeps dropping down and I can't see my tabs. Um, is adaptations, any upcoming adaptations for TV and film and keeping track of all of them because right now, adapting teen books into movies is the latest craze and it's happening pretty much every month. This is a good site, I have to say. It's kind of great just in general, but it'll give you um, updates, alerts on any movie or TV adaptations, and more increasingly, Broadway and musical adaptations. So for like um, Hamilton, which is all the craze with teens, if you haven't heard of it, look it up because it's kind of insanely popular, which uh, started as a book. And so, this is a good way, and I usually, for sites like these, I sign up for their mailing list so I don't have to remember to go back and check the site. Um, this is also good because on Fridays, they, they send out, they post on titles you need to know and recommend to your patrons. And so they find anything that they consider like a headline grabber or new titles by popular authors or a watch list of books they expect will really take off just based on word of mouth that's going on online. And they look at bestseller lists and they highlight any debut or breakout authors. So in general, it's kind of a really just good collection development tool all around. Okay, next up for collection development is books celebrating diversity. This is something that's a very hot button topic within youth services right now um, to the point where this is kind of what people are most arguing about. Um, <laughs> which is so much fun. Uh, so I wanna share with you some resources that can kind of help. Um, me, I'm not, I'm not an expert in any other race or culture, and I can't always understand if something might be offensive because I might not see it. And I am okay, and it's okay to admit that as a librarian. So it's about finding those resources that can help us focus down on that. And the first one I wanna point out Oh my goodness, there we go, is American Indians and Children's Literature. And this is, this is all done by the fabulous Debbie Reese. She goes on and she has a best, she has a best books list. She goes on and she reviews um, any resources that talk about Native Americans, um, even websites, um, knowing the difference between whether you refer to it as a nation instead of a culture you know little things like that that i might not know it's nice to have somebody else be able to tell me this is not a good thanksgiving book maybe you should buy this one instead and so she's very good about she knows her stuff much better than i would know this so i kind of go to this one if i'm looking to restock my thanksgiving collection because some of the ones we had were very old and thus um, not necessarily an accurate representation of the first thanksgiving all right um 
the next one for celebrating di diversity is this blog. It's called Reading While White. Um, this was started by white librarians in youth services. It's got a lot of guest writers of all different cultures and races. And they go on and they interview different authors. They review many, many different books. It's first one's really long and it will go through and it's honestly just a very good review site. It's very thorough. Um, this is another one I highly recommend signing up for their mailing list so it'll just come to your email. And their book reviews that they do, if I can find one, it must have been a little while, um, would look kind of like this. And they're very thorough and very honest and they don't really talk down to a reader, but they're very good at explaining if this is something you have in your collection, what issues you might face with your patrons and what they would think about it. So um, I, I do definitely recommend this one. So do I have any questions yet that have popped up? Other than someone asked if those uh, websites are also on the Moodle site, and I believe you, you do have yes. them on there. So yes. Other than that, nope. Okay, we're going good. I will progress. <laughs> All right, uh, the next thing for collection development is simply getting them to read. Um, you'll notice this with your older kids and your teens, they get busy. Um, how do we keep ourselves being a priority? How do we showcase our best of the best books? Uh, the first thing I want to just suggest is book displays. If you have any space at all, I don't care if it's a simple little table in the middle of your library, try to highlight a display. And we put out a display of bears a week ago. Within 24 hours, it was completely cleaned out. We're pretty sure it was a teacher who was just thinking, oh, I'm going to do a session on bears, and she took everything we had. Um, it's a good way to move them. Another thing is to show off your book covers. We are very visual as people. And like it or not, we judge books by their cover. So find those good ones that have really appealing covers to your kids and find a way to display them. Um, it can be as simple as propping up a single book at the end of your bookshelves or just on top of your bookshelves if you have low shelves in your children's area and just really marketing those. Um, another thing that I have really good success with is making sure I've got book lists and read-alike lists. So that way if a kid comes in and they've been through all of the Diary of a Wimpy Kid books and they need something else, I have a list of things that I can say, if you liked that, you should try this because you'll, you should like this one as well. And it can help just give them a focus. Um, with those, you can do them as, you know, a simple little poster that you hang up. Or if you have a website, attaching those lists to your website. Or maybe you just do it as a bookmark and you put it at the end of one of your shelves by your Diary of a Wimpy Kid books. Um, or just simply using it as a reader's advisory tool that you have the list available for staff when that way you've got it handy. Um, at least know where you can find those online. Um, and I'll have a site later that I should be able to share that might help with some different reader's advisory tools. Okay, um, the next thing is um, series. Um, series are really huge <laughs> with children's and even more so with teen books. And how to keep track of them can sometimes be um, the bane of our existence. For me, I'm not a huge fan of standing orders, uh, particularly because my trends shift so rapidly within teens. Books one and two might have checked out hugely, and then book three only checked out twice. I don't really want to order book four. It's easier for me to interlibrary loan it, maybe. But what I use to kind of keep track of what series are where is this website, and it is called Fit Fact. It is free. It's honestly very, very easy to use. If I go on and I search, let's see, I'll search the one I was talking about earlier. That'll make it easy. Um, oh, it would help if I spelled it right. There we go. If I search Illuminae or I search an author, it's going to present me any books that have that in the title or series that have that on the title. And I'm like, I know this is the one I'm looking for. So I can go on here and how I use it is I set up an account and I would follow a series. And this one, I'm like, okay, I bought this book. So how I use it is instead of using it as a read list, I say, 
I've read, I've bought this and I use my read as a purchase thing. And so then if I go up and I look at my next book list, which might take a little while to order because it's extensively long right now. We are undergoing a series project as we speak, so. It always adds your newest one to the bottom. It will add it to this next book list. And so when I go on to do my purchases, this kind of gives me a gauge of where I'm at when I'm buying different series. So then if I'm like, okay, well, I just put this on my book order, I'm gonna go ahead and mark this as read right now. Mark as read. And that will take it off of that list and I don't have to see it again. The other good thing, let me find an example. Is you can move it to the top if it's no use, you're something you want to order earlier and. A lot of these are my older series. Ah, there's one. Right here, the Dark Days pack, it'll say coming soon, January 31st. So it will show up on here depending on when it's added to that series. And this is very easy. If you're, if you're looking for a series and it's not on here yet, you can manually add the series as well. And then it goes to them for approval. So, um, which is a very easy system. But it will also send you email updates when new stuff is added to your book list. So that's also very, very nice because sometimes I just look at that email and I'm like, okay, that was a new book that was just added. So I put it right on my book order and I just pre-order it right then. Yeah. All right, moving right along. <laughs> Um, I want to address some different possible alternatives to just simple books. Um, the first up, the discs, DVDs, um, particularly educational DVDs in your children's area, even if it's things like Bill Nye the Science Guy and Magic School Bus or the DK Eyewitness series or even some Dora the Explorer, some of those you can pick up fairly cheap and they check out really well. And they have a pretty good, for most of them, educational component. So I feel like it really does fit with that mission of literacy in the library. Um, a lot of mine too, sometimes I'll wait and try to find them used or sometimes people will donate stuff that their kids outgrow but they're not necessarily dated materials. So I really like that. Another thing with different, um, disc media as I would recommend is maybe CDs. If you are already buying CDs for story time music, you might consider if adding them to your collection. Um, for us, we use a music player because we go out a lot. So we put those songs on our computer and we download it to a device. And so our CDs go immediately into the collection so our parents can check it out. Because when we're doing the goldfish song every week in story time and that kid wants to go home and do the goldfish song at home or tootie ta you know i'm just more than happy to to send those lovely lovely songs home with our parents so they have to listen to it on repeat a thousand times over the weekend so those are honestly a good resource and often those are ones you're already buying so if there's any way you can put them into your collection and make them accessible to your patrons it's kind of a win-win um, the other thing here is parenting resources, um, and I kind of group parent and teacher resources together. So sometimes if I'm buying a book that has to do with story time, like the story time magic or one on flannel boards, if I'm not going to use it on a regular basis, I put that out in my parenting collection so our parents have access to those resources too. Or I just get different nonfiction parenting books. Um, Library Journal, when they have their issue, they usually have a parenting section that reviews some of the latest parenting titles. Um, and it can give you some nice brief suggestions. Sometimes I also just look at what's selling best on Amazon or Barnes and Noble and, and gauge from there. And it's, it's good to have those materials either as a subset of your children's collection or just in your adult nonfiction collection. So yeah, don't forget about those. Um, my last little picture here, 
represents something we have at our library here that works really well as a collection, and we have a toy lending library. And how this works is we have different games, puppets, um, different educational toys that all focus on different early literacy activities or motor skills with our kids. And they're a very handy component to work with. Um, we just put on the out, we have them all in storage tubs, so they're all self-contained with latching lids. And we put on the outside what's supposed to be on the inside, so when it comes back, we have a handy checklist right there, and we know if something is missing. And some of the toys, if one little tiny piece is missing, it doesn't mean it can't still be played, so we don't worry too much about um, fines on missing materials. It just really depends on the different circumstances. But it honestly here works out wonderfully. A lot of our parents use it if they're going on a road trip for the holidays as a way to take a toy that's all in one container as opposed to taking their child's entire toy box. So I hope, so let's see, any questions yet? Okay. This thing is okay. Um, some big events that I always like to point out to make sure everybody's aware of that kind of focus a lot on youth services. This is sort of a general list. I won't really touch on each of these, um, but and I will make sure like this list will also be on Moodle, so you'll kind of have an idea of things to keep in mind. Um, Summer Library Program is the one that has the big question mark on here. And that is because the brilliant thing about the Summer Library Program is it's super important for youth services um, as a way to help combat the summer slide because with each time that a child isn't reading over the summer, that ability to gain those skills back when the school year starts, it makes it so much harder on them. So anything we can do to reward that. But with this, your program can really be as long or as short as you choose. If you want to do a two-week program in the summer, that's fine. If you want to go all out and start it in May and go through August, you know, uh, more power to you. Um, you're, you're braver than I am. Uh, but it can be also as complex or as simple as you want. And I'll go over some different suggestions for that um, in the next part. Um, some other things I want to just kind of briefly point out is um, at the very bottom, and this is one that a lot of people don't know about, is International Games Day at your library. This is sponsored by the American Library Association. It's co-sponsored by the Australian equivalent of the American Library Association and a different part in Norway as well that also co-sponsors. They've worked with Italy before as well. It is, this coming year will be the 10th annual event. It started as a national event and within three years of that, it grew to an international. One year, all eight continents participated, including Antarctica. So it's kind of nice when you register, some of the gaming companies that sponsor this event will actually send you free games that you can add to either a circulating collection or just to your programming collection if you just want to have games as a possibility for future programs. So honestly, it's win-win and it's free to sign up and the games they send you are free. So, and some of the games they send are amazing games. So, and I, I honestly love the, the program and the kids always have a lot of fun. So actually all ages, we run it for everybody. So we have a lot of adults that come and hang out and you know, put out Scrabble boards or chess boards. It can be a very simple event. A lot of people don't do it too complex. Can you talk a little bit about how to register for that uh, uh, Games Day? There is a website, and registration goes up usually around the middle of the summer. Um, and it's igd.ala.org or you can just search International Games Day at your library, and that will also get you there. And when registration opens, this, this link will become active. Right now, this is still fixed from last year's, so it won't actually do much good. Um, it takes them a little while to update it once stuff is over, because they issue the final reports. They had 1,730 libraries participate this last year, so. You can see all the dots. It's always a, a nice sight to see. Um, when you see start seeing some of them spread out on different continents, it's, it's rather impressive. 
um, one year we participated in a game of global gossip, which was a game of telephone, basically. So we spent an hour at our library whispering a phrase from one person to another and tracking what that phrase was. We were contacted by a library in Arizona and they called over the phone and whispered the phrase to me. And when we were done, we called and whispered a phrase to a library in New York. So it kind of goes everywhere. And honestly, that, that year, it was just a lot of fun for the, the kids to be able to participate something on an international scale. All right, I will move to the next area, um, which is programming. Um, okay, uh, wanna make sure there's, there is a difference when you're dealing with youth services of year round programming versus summer programming. Um, the content and amount of things you do is probably gonna be hugely different. Um, some regular suggestions. I imagine most of you are already doing story times of different types, whether you're breaking it down into different ages, because um, you've got usually like a preschool story time perhaps, or one specifically designed for toddlers, or maybe even one for your babies. Um, whether you know it's a lapsid or mother goose, everybody has their own little title for it. Some things I always want to point out, because a lot of libraries that I talk to typically end their story time, they have that typical structure where they read, they do finger plays, a song and dance, maybe a flannel board, and they usually end with some kind of a craft. I always want to put out the suggestion, don't forget other just activities as well that can highlight um, their motor skills at the end as an option. A lot of times, instead of giving them something they have to make and take home and mom has to sneakily throw away next week, we just do an activity. We might put out blocks and let the kids free build, or we let them sort different objects using um, tongs to work on their fine motor skills, or practice tracing letters is something we're doing this week, or even practice using scissors. We use our preschool story time a lot to help them prepare for preschool. So we try to work on some of those skills. I know the state is trying to come up with different standards um, for entry into preschools. And so we're trying to mirror a lot of what they're doing to help prepare our kids to be ready. And we always kind of like that as just a good goal. Another suggestion I always want to throw out to people for story times is to think about incorporating um, American Sign Language, ASL, into it. We typically do this, we pick one word. Um, this, this week it's snow. Um, sometimes it might just be a color and we do yellow. And we reinforce it throughout the story time. And actually we reinforce it every week. And it's nice to see the kids come back who are so excited that two months later, they still remember how to say pirates. And this is really good. It's proven successful for kids who struggle to communicate. For any child with a disability, this can help expand those communication skills. It's never too early to start incorporating this. Um, it's also been proven to help reduce tantrums in young, young children. Before they're able to talk, they are able to sign and say they want food. And so it's a, it's a really just good idea and it does help with literacy skills. So it's just a huge bonus. Um, a site that I could definitely recommend for that. I'm gonna close some of these down so I can actually, is this one, it's called Signing Savvy. And so if I search a word like face, And I go down and I find that, and I face as in body parts. It will give me a visual demonstration of how to say face. And so it's really nice. Um, and honestly, our kids really enjoy it. And our parents are really getting into it as well that are with their kids. And it's kind of become a challenge. We always tell them, try to use this between now and next story time, see if you can use this when you're out and about. And so a lot of them are, are able to, so it's really fun. Pirate was probably our trickiest one. You know, I don't know how you incorporate that into everyday conversation, but. All right. There we go. All right, um, the next thing is just, um, 
Right at the bottom, I have, we do STEAM as an after-school program for kindergarten through fifth, but really any after-school program would work quite well. With this, we usually use STEAM because pretty much everything we're doing falls into science, technology, engineering, art, and math in one way or another. So we really like to be able to, to utilize that. And it works for any age group. STEAM programming works just as well for your younger, younger kids too. Um, even if it's something, we do simple things, like we will discuss, for engineering, we'll talk about flight, and then we'll make paper airplanes or straw airplanes, which is always super cool, and most of the kids don't know that you can make an airplane out of a straw and three little slivers of an index card. So it's a super easy little craft. I'll try to put a link to that as well. Um, other good, just general, regular programming is um, having movie days. Um, make sure you have a movie license. Uh, so you're not breaking the law. <laughs> it's a good way to get families into the library that might not typically come to the library. Um, we typically do a movie day as a family Friday, or we'll have our family Friday as a game day, which is another great resource. Craft time is also really good. Any of these, I always market them to parents as a real, and to our board, as a real life social networking opportunity. It's at home when kids are playing games, they're typically doing it online. This gives them a chance to do it with family or friends. Um, it also, more importantly for some of these, because some of them are a little harder to tie into literacy skills than others, my goal with some of these is simply to introduce patrons to our library. Show them the potential other resources that we have, and a lot of times they will use those resources while they are here doing this random activity. Um, that being said, games do have a good component with literacy skills. Um, that is also very, very proven, and I will make sure to give you um, details on that as well on the Moodle. Um, so if you decide to incorporate gaming in your library, it's, it's very, very important for literacy skills. Okay, let me... Oh, oh my goodness, it started over. Bear with me. All right, um, some general suggestions that I just want to give you guys, because I like to give people different ideas of things they can implement quickly and cheaply with their kids and their teens. The very first picture is stickers. Okay, it's do-it-yourself stickers, which requires two things. It requires markers, which I'm guessing all of you have in your library, and it requires contact paper. Um, and if you don't have a laminator in your library, I imagine you've probably got contact paper rolls there too. This is something that you can just put out on a table and let them do it. It doesn't require much staff time to do. It's got a wide gender and age appeal. I know the picture there is just flowers, so it makes it seem a little girly, but you give that and you tell the boys, hey, can you make us some really cool monsters? Um, by doing it on contact paper, it also means that it is a re reusable sticker, so they can, if they change their mind, they can peel it off one thing and stick it on something else. So a lot of my kids, when they do it, they put this on their school books and stuff to decorate them up because it doesn't do any damage. So um, The next little picture is my little lizard. This is a glitter tattoo. This is something that does require a little more work, so it's typically something I would only do with teens. Um, but again, it's contact paper, markers, glitter, obviously, scissors, and the instructions for these are on Moodle, or if they're not, they, I will make sure that they are on there today. Rubbing alcohol, which would need to be staff supervised, um, and then some cotton pads or swabs, which are pretty easy to get. And your two a little more unusual things are clear eyelash glue, which is a little weird, <laughs> and hairspray. So the, my rule on this is that they can only do it on their body. They can't do it on their face because you'd need a whole different set of supplies that cost a little more and nobody wants to get glitter in their eyes. Um, so it requires special glitter. Um, essentially, I put out designs of different kinds. They trace those designs onto the contact paper. They cut that out, that shape. They peel it and they stick it on their skin. They trace that pattern out with the eyelash glue. They put the glitter onto that glue, and then they spray it with hairspray to seal it, and it's done. It looks a lot more complicated than it actually is because it is basically a trace and complete craft. 
Um, the other thing on here is pop tab bracelets, and I know the instructions for that are already on Moodle. Um, this is a really cheap craft because you need two things. Well, three. You need scissors, but you need you pop tabs. The question? Can you repeat that? What one? Uh, about the steps for the, you traced it, you cut it out, and then I lost you. You trace it onto contact paper, you cut out the outline, you peel it and stick that onto your skin, the shape. Okay. And then you trace around that shape with eyelash glue. And then at that point, you can go ahead and peel that design off. And then you just sprinkle some glitter onto that eyelash glue just to get it, just to get it covered. And then you just seal it with a coat of hairspray. And I just use cheap hairspray. Nice big bottle of that, you know, what is that? Aqua, aqua or something. Yeah. <laughs> and then it's done. And I actually did this really successfully um, one year for teens as a glow in the dark party. And we used glow in the dark glitter. And it was awesome. So thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, so the pop tab bracelets, um, the steps are already up on there. The pop tabs, if you tell your community that you need pop tabs from soda cans or beer cans, I just make sure I try to clean the beer stall off of them, you will have more pop tabs than you know what to do with, which means this is a free craft, essentially, with the exception of your elastic cord, which costs next to nothing if you buy a big spool of it on Amazon, which is usually what I do. You can also do this with ribbon, but I found elastic cord is easier for my teens to work with, ultimately, because it stretches as opposed to having to tie your bracelet on each time, which they just find to be cumbersome. Um, what I like about this is it takes them a little while to get into the pattern of making it, but once they get it, they can roll right through the entire thing and help each other. And it's a good sneaky way to help my kids who are struggling with math, because usually the ones who are struggling with math in school, it's because they can't pick up on pattern recognition. Like you do the same step each time. It's very hard for them to grasp. So this is a good way to kind of help with those repeating patterns, which is what I really, really love about it. Um, and on my, on the instructions I've had on Moodle, I've got two different ones. I have a full sheet of instructions that sometimes I will just set out. And then I also use sometimes I do flip cards a lot that are a half sheet of paper and I laminate them and I put them on a little metal O-ring so I can give them flip cards. So if they're doing it independently, they can just follow the steps through a flip book. Okay. Um, just I'm not sure. Uh, we've got like three minutes left in the program. Oh, okay. so let, me, <laughs> just let me jump forward then. I will skip this segment. Some of these details I'll have up on there. Um, summer's really the only thing I wanted to make sure to cover a little bit of. Um, this summer's theme is build a better world. At, is build a better world. Um, so make sure you're thinking about it. I've got real quick. Um, the on Moodle for your assignment for this class, I just do discussion questions. So to get your grade, essentially, it's basically participation. I want to do something that's actually going to be helpful for you. So I put some discussion points. You can kind of participate in whatever is most useful for you to give you a chance to share ideas or ask questions of myself or one of your fellow directors here. And we can really kind of help share ideas. Um, these are some summer ideas. One of the things I always want to point out is the possibility this summer, touch a truck. Like if you have construction and police vehicles and stuff in your neighborhood, see if they'll come park their trucks on a day outside of your library and just let kids see them. Um, it's, a, it's a very easy thing to do. The hardest part is getting your community people to commit to it, but it's a lot of fun. Um, the building picture here is we're going to do some city planning models with our kids of how would you plan a city? What would you have? And show us where your parks would be and your library. And so we'll kind of talk about what makes a really good community. And my last one of my hammer is going to be one of my teen programs. Um, I don't know how many other people are fans of Gilmore Girls, but this was kind of spawned by that. At, in one episode, her mom bedazzles a hammer. Um, and it's, I think I actually have a picture of that. Let me see. I do. It can kind of hurt, it's kind of hard to see in this. Um, oh, now I just made it blurry. Anyway, it's covered with fur and sequins 
and lace and all things pretty. So that's literally going to be uh, one of my teen programs this, um, this summer because I thought, why not? Let's see if I can. And um, I think, you know, Dollar Tree has those hammers for dollar a piece. Yes. I love the Dollar Tree for craft supplies because it's just honestly the best thing in the world. Um, yeah, the only other thing I really had on here was just networking. Make sure you're networking with your, your local school, any of your community leaders, your fellow librarians, um, myself included, and just really make sure you're sharing those resources. Um, I'll post some more ideas of stuff I wasn't able to cover today. It's a lot more question and answers than last year, so it took a little longer, so yay. Um, and then I'll just make sure my contact information is on the last little bit. It's right here. Um, so feel free, if you ever have any questions, um, comment, anything that you wanna share, this is my email address and my work phone number. Um, if, you're, if you call me at work, you have to be very specific and ask for Jennifer because we have a Jenny here as well. So, um, And then on the bottom is, I went ahead and included this last minute. It's, it's a blog I write with um, a friend and colleague who's Mary Beth Schaefer. She's the technology consultant for the Central Kansas Library System. And so she writes a little more on the tech aspect of things. And I, I do a lot of youth service ideas, suggestions, and occasionally some adult programming suggestions. Um, so it might be of some use to you. I tend to around this time really go gung ho in preparation for summer ideas. So I think that's that's it for me right now. Unless you guys have any questions. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. I hope it was useful. I could ramble forever about youth services. So. <laughs> Nope, it just looks like uh, thank yous from the from the group. So, uh, yeah, that doesn't look like any questions. Thank you very much for coming and Wonderful. and doing this. That, that was an awesome uh, presentation. Youth services is not anything I've ever worked in, other than covering the teen desk a couple of times. But uh, you're a so. fun bunch. I just love them. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. You're welcome.